I'm pretty happy to introduce Merce. Merce is also a graduate of uh, one of the master programs. She's also done a PhD in solar thermal, and then uh, she is advising the community strategically as well. Uh, I think uh, fighting as well for more uh, women in the energy sector, uh, involved in plenty of uh, yes. different initiatives, and now is also in um, Solar Power Europe, the senior policy advisor. She will tell us loads about digital energy transition, and digitize, digitalizing solar. Right, yeah, so, so actually... So I, yours. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I made a change from solar thermal, what was concentrated in solar power, and now I'm working on PV. So uh, that was funny because during the interview, during the job interview, thank you, they asked me, but why? It's like you have just uh, focused during the last six years of your life in CSP. And now you are applying for a job just to be an advisor on solar PV. And I said, yes. So why on earth? It's like, well, uh, to me, it makes sense because to me, uh, it doesn't make sense at all to just invest all of our money in just one or two or three technologies, but to invest our money into a wide range of technologies and see which of them will win the race. Actually, never will be a second, uh, a third, a second, or a third one. Our future also will be like a clumsy solutions of a wide range of technologies that are performing some like better or worse than the others. And so I convinced them and I got the job. <laughs> Good. Um, so actually, um, eight years ago, I was living in Barcelona. And I was, um, I was doing an internship in the Catalan government. Uh, and you know, actually, the, the job was great. So great environment, good staff. And actually, it was next to my place, which also was very convenient. So good thing. However, um, I knew that it was, coming to, it was coming to an end. And also, I had the feeling inside me that, that it was not right for me you know, that something was missing. So now I have always like an Apple A, B, and C for almost like everything I do. But back then that was not the case. I swear, I was totally lost. Um, so actually, um, until one day, I saw an advert in the web page of the Technical University of Barcelona. And this advert was in the website of Inno Energy and said something like this. We need an informed, engaged, and ambitious workforce to join the sustainable energy transition and achieve a sustainable European energy industry. And they got me just right there. So I decided to join Inno Energy as a master student and to start a journey to make the European energy industry more sustainable. And now, eight years later, I'm the senior policy advisor at Solar Power Europe. And Solar Power Europe is the European Solar Association with more than 200 corporations, um, englobing small and big corporations all along the solar PV value chain and also we comprise all the European solar associations. And our aim is that more energy is produced by solar than by any other source by 2030. So a senior policy advisor for digitalization on solar in Europe, I am not alone in this journey, otherwise I would be nuts, <laughs> but at least these companies here on my back there accompanying me uh, together with the others in this fight. So as you know, the uh, cost of uh, clean energy technologies has dramatically decreased over the years, accelerating the transition to more sustainable energy systems worldwide. So at the same time, um, there has been a, a fundamental transformation from old analog to more and more digital. And digital technologies have been crucial uh, to decarbonize the energy systems. 
But as you, as you know, and as you have heard by my colleagues before, uh, this transition is not happening fast enough. So we need to do something. We need to accelerate this transition to a more decarbonized energy future. So for this, actually, it's crucial that we leverage the potential of smart and digital technologies that are already available today. So we have the drones, we have blockchain, we have artificial intelligence, um, Internet of Things, smart meters. So actually, uh, these technologies are crucial to make renewable energy more controllable, uh, more efficient, and also more cost competitive for the customers, so for you. And these technologies are all available today, so we actually don't need any uh, breakthrough uh, to happen. So the uh, future energy system will be shaped by uh, what I call it the four Ds. Digitalization, decarbonization, decentralization, and democratization. And uh, solar is the most distributed of all distributed technologies. And for this, is the best fitted for uh, digitalization and also for the application of distributed ledger technologies like blockchain. And uh, the digitalization of solar will be one of the most powerful rates of light for the new digital energy transition. So actually, uh, why solar should go digital? Uh, the digitalization of the energy sector uh, will save about 70 a billion euros per year. So imagine how that can alleviate the public finances and also how it can reduce your bill, the consumer bill. And the new generation of PV inverters, they would allow to feed more controllable solar into the grids, so to provide ancillary services for network operators that are more accurate than conventional generators. Also, the digitalization will enhance sector coupling. So imagine that uh, it will break boundaries among the sectors, meaning that for the power sector, you will have the rooftops uh, with the solar installations and the stationary batteries. For transport, you will have the electric vehicle with a smart charging station at your home, and you will have the smart buildings with um, a smart uh, heating and cooling. So actually, uh, if you imagine how this digitalization can enhance a sector coupling, you can imagine your home. So you can have one home with solar in the rooftop, uh, with your batteries, and you have the electric vehicle parked outside. So the smart charging station um, will use uh, the batteries and then just uh, charge the electric vehicle during these periods of the day that are like with the lowest consumption in your household. And uh, digitalization will maximize the value of solar in Europe. So actually, the digitalization can enhance um, the value of the digital products and niche products. So actually, to stay ahead of global competitors, EU policymakers they should target research and development investment into the more uh, digitalized segments of the solar sector. In these are, for instance, the manufacturing of the wafers, the panels, operations and maintenance, um, asset management of large-scale solar PV plants, or building integrated PV. So how can we use these digital technologies and apply them into innovative solar business models? This is just one example. So this is an example of one best practice, uh, innovative business model of a data platform in Estonia that is called uh, SFEED. So this data platform gathers data from like uh, weather forecast data of solar irradiation, or market price data, um, congestion data, smart meter data, and connects it uh, with a final customer. So actually, it's interesting because uh, this innovation, this model enhances, fosters innovation because one of the most important barriers 
uh, for new entrants, for startups, is the lack of uh, energy data. So these type of platforms that will allow the provision of non-sensitive uh, energy data to final customers. A second example of best practice is uh, the one that we can find in Switzerland. So the traditional way of self-consumption is, well, you know what it is. So actually you generate and consume, and if you actually still need some electricity, you buy it from the uh, local utility. But this one is actually, it allows a group of households and businesses to group together and form a consortium, and they can exchange electricity between each other, breaking out from the local utility, gaining energy independence, and also decreasing the um, electricity bills. And the third example, also it relates uh, with regulation as before, is the regulatory sandboxes that we can see in the UK with an energy regulator that has utilized this. And so it uses regulatory sandboxes, so are actually like, like a safe space for innovation in terms of regulation. And it uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy trading uh, coupled with artificial intelligence and blockchain. So imagine a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform uh, coupled with blockchain. So what it does to send uh, one kilowatt of electricity from uh, the rooftop of one household to the neighbor building. So the aim of this is to test whether actually peer-to-peer -peer energy trading with artificial intelligence and blockchains uh, optimizes the generation and consumption of a, a community-owned uh, solar installation to test whether actually decreases uh, energy bills and uh, increases energy independence, which it does, of course. And however, uh, despite all these uh, innovative business models, uh, the digitalization of solar is not happening fast enough. So. We need actually to understand the process. We need to understand what it means to digitalize the energy sector. Um, how we can learn from it, what needs to be done. How can we bring all these smart and digital technologies and innovative business models to each household in Europe, to every citizen? And for this, uh, the European Commission set up a, a consultation and asked expert groups about how they see, how they understand the digitalization of the energy sector and what needs to be done. And I, together with uh, the members of Solar Power Europe, we responded to this consultation. And the key takeaways looks like following. So the first one is to increase the use of the digital platforms. So to increase the access of non-sensitive energy data uh, for consumers. In, that should be no, done in a transparent and also a reliable way. And remember the example of the digital platform or SFIT. The second one is to increase the data sharing and data access. So actually, if you are a, a customer and you generate data, you should be allowed to access your data. There should be a customer right. So that can be done, for instance, with um, blockchain-based authentication systems that you actually can access the data that you produced in a secure manner and also in a transparent manner. And the third one is to increase the interoperability to unlock uh, sector coupling. So by this, I mean uh, also imagine your home. So you have the appliances, the devices, you have the washing machine, you have the fridge. And on the other side, you have the flexibility sources, which is the um, solar panels with the batteries and also the electric vehicle with the smart charging station. So these devices, they should talk to each other. They should be able to transmit interoperable data to each other, but not only to each other in one single house unit, but also to several market players, including the citizens, so including you. And um, so setting the vision of a digital future is crucial 
for a digital energy transition. So eight, eight years ago, I swear I had no idea what I was going to do. But I'm glad that the future brought me here today with you, where I can stand in front of you and ask you to, to join me, to work passionately, uh, to have like a, a future shaped by the four Ds, which is digitalization, decarbonization, decentralization, and most importantly, democratization. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Comments or questions for Merce? Hi, um, Anka, I have some comments and questions, I think, and they are uh, combined. I see and hear what you have said for many years. Uh, nowadays, I have the feeling, it's a personal feeling, that most of these things are just keywords and they are very far from reality. Uh, smart meters we should have in Europe. Sorry, we do not have them. Most countries have uh, implemented dummy ones that are not smart at all. Germany, no way. They, they are just implementing for medium and high loads the smart meters for normal consumers out of questions. I just received six months ago a very old, a very new Ferrari meter. <laughs> um, and house and PV and car, everything I see this example, even though it has been proven that it's more sustainable to live in blocks. Uh, nowadays, everything that is being built has maximum 30% of the parkings um, available with a charging station. And it's not possible to increase the capacity to charge more than 30 cars out of 120. Uh, for the next 15 or 20 years, because the price would be too much. So actually, there's no possibility to go beyond this limit. Um, and one more thing, we increase digital, we need more data, we need more data storage. This needs way more energy, and we know how um, much energy we need for that. So how much are we really efficient? I mean, and regarding the access to data. For example, in, for the um, solar, we, it would be really, we have such, I, we provide such a solution with my company to um, see the city and according to open data, if available, you can see what is the inclination of the rooftop and if it's uh, good for PV or not. Great. Um, Germany, if you want to pay, uh, get this data for stress in Holstein, you have to pay one million euro. It's prohibitive. You cannot pay. As a private company, you cannot pay so much money. And afterwards, every year, a couple of hundred thousand euros. Because data is not for free. It's just one provider. Um, which is a government, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so my question actually is, is how do we get from these keywords to reality when the uh, reality shows that we are actually locked very much from this, uh, we are locked away from these keywords? At least this is the reality that I see now and for the next 15 years. Yeah. And that with 15, 20 years, which is almost very close to 2050 when we should be very far away. Yeah, so, I'm, seriously, I don't know how to believe any more in these keywords? Any You're ideas? totally right. And actually, I, our job is, is about that, about how to um, talk to the citizens and to uh, inform them, to increase the awareness about, one, these possibilities that that exists and how they could do that, if they could do that, if the national regulations allow that. So our job is, one, to figure out all these whole options to uh, distribute information as the clear, with the clearest way as possible, in the simple way as possible, and then uh, to talk to the national policymakers and explain that what they need to do, and what they need to do is that there should be a more rational plan for the deploying of the smart meters, for instance, or also there should be also a more rational plan for the deploying of the smart charging stations, 
or maybe that all the new buildings, there should be also built with solar on the rooftops. So we try to communicate these exact ideas, these are some pain points, one to policy makers and also to local associations of citizens and try to bridge between them and not only between them but also try to, to help them. So we point them to one, these solutions and also to point them to, to regulations. Hey, actually you need to change this if you want to get that. And for that, what we do is to uh, go around Europe and try to find these best practice models. So these are like very specific, very local cases that we have found or in Estonia or in Switzerland or somewhere else. And we believe that that would be useful or would make sense to use them somewhere else. For that, we are not saying that they should do it, but they should know about them. And most of the time, they don't know it. So maybe for you, this is the first time that you know about some of them, or about all, all of them, or maybe you knew all, all of them, so good for you. I didn't know when I started the job. But this is one of the problems, misinformation. So what we try to do is condense all these possibilities, all these best practices, and try to um, distribute the knowledge and try to see whether it would make sense to, for these best practices to be applied or with some changes, obviously, to certain uh, national setups. Any other comments, questions? Andres? Thank you. One, 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 one question. Uh, any distributed approach uh, is going to happen or it needs to happen with the consensus or with the collaboration of the distribution companies, uh, which are kind of willing to take care of this, of this problem on their own way, which mainly gives them the advantage or, or not. For instance, in Spain, you're aware there was a very hot issue with the uh, sun tax, yeah. which gave a lot of headaches to everyone. So what is your relation with the distros? Uh, do you have any joint approach or ways of building this kind of WOCA? <laughs> that we draw all together in the same direction, because otherwise it's very difficult that these kind of things, let's see, like a smart meters or distributed generators or, or a very large uh, penetration of renewables, prosumers, uh, storage, would ever happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work on off-grid, micro-grid, so I really care not so much about distros in that sense, but uh, when you are inside the system, you either get disconnected, so you do whatever you, pleases you, or if you're connected, you need to have some kind of agreement, and sometimes that is the thing that is keeping us uh, from doing things, right? Yeah, that's right. Also, we are in touch with TSOs and DSOs and try to see how we can solve things together in a collaborative way. Because uh, what is for sure is that we are not going to solve anything if we just walk alone. That's for sure. So that's why it takes so much time and effort to create these consortiums, to create these uh, agreements for, to make a specific asks. Because actually when you ask for something, you need to ask for some, one thing, very specific. Otherwise they just won't pay attention. And just to make one ask, like for instance, to build a solar rooftop in all new buildings, that takes time, that's not done in just one week. So we need to talk to the other partners, to the other sites like or TSO, DSOs and other associations and ask for these specific things. So we, yes, we are in touch with them. We are trying to see how we can um, modify or influ uh, with influence regulation uh, and try to get these best practices adopted. Anyone else? mix of comment and question, because uh, from my point of view, I see a slight contradiction, or let's call it hurdle, in terms of data sharing, because I just have in mind what I hear. On the one side, I see uh, companies who own uh, data platforms, who own data center, and consider data as an asset for their business models. And on the other side, uh, you talk about data sharing, and uh, I can imagine that those companies who have 
or the cost to host those data don't want to give those data away for free and then how to organize by send data sharing this could be a big hurdle and I don't know how to overcome such things. Yeah, one way is to um, for third part to be third parties to create these data platforms. So maybe it can be even the government. So is to be to, for you to be able to um, recover to get access to your data from your home or from the buildings. Of course, that should be uh, anonymized data and non-sensitive data as well. It can be done in an aggregated way. So yeah, there are some business models that they earn money based on that, based on the storing and doing something and crunching the data. But also we should think about this other option, the ones that actually would benefit you. Yeah, but I have in mind is, uh, if, uh, let's say, uh, 10 households share the data among them, then uh, the owner of, of a data platform or a data center may already consider, hey, this will uh, reach into my business model because there are 10, 10 people, 10 households sharing the data center, not 10, 10 households, and so on and so on. At the end, uh, my whole business model uh, of uh, generating some value uh, will get lost because I don't can generate there anymore the whole set of data. There I see is some sort of danger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you agree or just a perception. Of course, there would be of course there would be business models that they will clash together. So we need to sit down in a table and, and talk and discuss about how we can um, find solutions on that. Because also it's true that not only companies they have a win, also we should have the right to access our data if we want. Okay, then I, I have one. Uh, you came from Solar Thermal. You said Solar Power Europe also uh, pushed Solar Thermal, or not at all? And uh, and follow up question that and uh, you you mentioned I think one of the big aims or missions of Solar Power Europe is to be the number one technological kind of energy mm -hmm. producing energy source, source until 2030, right? Yeah. yeah it was a, so why this kind of approach of confrontational towards the other technologies? Oh, because now we need to be positive. You know, we need, and that's all about our, our organization. We just try not to spread um, depressing messages, if I may say the word. So we need to be optimistic. So we defend solar. So we want this source to be like the winner renewable one for 2030. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so um, now, uh, if there is no further comments or questions, I would close it, and I would like to again thank Merci.